Our mission at SD Bullion is clear, the lowest cost gold and silver available online. While we do not have pretty blue boxes, free shipping on every order, or glamorous gold and silver infomercials, SD Bullion has the lowest prices that may save you hundreds on your next order. So before you make your next investment, do the math and join the over 40,000 new customers who have recently made the switch to SD Bullion. Why pay more? Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with SilverDoctors.com, and with us today is Danielle Martino Booth, the author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America. Danielle is a former advisor for the Dallas former Fed president, Richard Fisher. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I'd first like to discuss the premise of your book. Why is the Fed bad for America, and how did working at the Fed, the Dallas Fed convince you of this? Well, I, I joined the Dallas Fed because I felt like I could really try and make a difference on the inside as the housing crisis was barreling down upon the economy. And I realized in the aftermath of the crisis, um, when the worst of the heat had come off, that there was this great opportunity to change this institution. And it, it was just it was a matter of whistling past the graveyard. It, it was an opportunity that was completely squandered. Um, and that really did upset me, given the amount of damage that the Fed has done to our economy over the years. Can you get, I guess, maybe more specific on why you think the Fed is bad for America? Sure. Um, the Fed has effectively, through its policies, basically since Alan Greenspan has been in office, don't get me wrong, um, interest rates uh, were obviously too high during the early 1980s. But the Federal Reserve has, has pursued a policy of keeping interest rates too low for too long, over and over again, and in doing so, it really has changed the complexion of our culture. We've become an economy that is driven by the creation of debt rather than investing today, saving today for tomorrow. It really has changed the way we operate as households, as corporations, as a government, and it's changed our standing on the global stage as well. It's weakened our country. I know you've said that low interest rates are kind of heroin pushing the economy towards a, another collapse. Can you expand on that? Of course. Well, what we have is we have, I, I call them serial bubble blowers. The Fed has become uh, a facilitator, if you will. They're the drug dealer, to use your heroin um, analogy. They are the person, they're the entity, if you will, that keeps putting more and more and more debt out into the economy, hoping that it will have a lasting impact. And what we've seen is a series of so-called jobless recoveries in the aftermath of these misguided policies that have, again, put the economy on a much weaker footing. And as we have learned Every time we come out of recession and the Fed um, answers recession with more and more and more credit creation, what they have found, what we have seen, is that they actually have to create more every single time. And the unwind is what we call a correction or a credit crash. And every time it's going to be a little bit bigger. Now, I know you've said that if Hillary Clinton would have won the presidential election, things would stay the same. But do you think that with Donald Trump, there is actually a possibility of reforming the Fed? Can you expand on this? Of course. Um, look, we needed an outsider always. We always needed an outsider to come in and put their foot down to the Fed because the Fed is in many ways – it's, it's kind of your establishment politician's dream come true because you can do all kinds of things if interest rates are held at artificially low levels. Um, and it, but, but again, it would have taken a complete outsider who's not beholden to any lobbyist, who's not beholden to any special interest group to appoint much more independent thinking people to the Fed. And I think that Donald Trump could be that person. And I say could be. I speak as optimistically as I can. Now, I know that uh, Congressman Rand Paul and also Congressman Thomas Massey have been trying to get uh, audit the Fed bill passed through Congress. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think auditing the Fed would uh, help matters at all? Well, if it 
stays in its current form, I certainly do. But if you put the right people in, then you don't have to go back and audit the Fed. If you install strong leaders who have absolutely no agenda, they're not driven by any academic ideology. If you put strong leaders in at the Fed, then you negate the need to have to audit it in the first place. It becomes an apolitical, independent, strong institution on its own. Now, you've talked about this, how the Fed seems too political nowadays. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, when the, when the Fed... Uh, when, when the Fed was really building its power seat, if you will, uh, it did so by buying securities and increasing the size of the balance sheet. Now it's at four, four and a half trillion dollars. Well, this is a source of power for the Fed. So I found it to be very curious that right after the election, a subject that they considered to be sacrosanct, the sacred cow, if you will, the balance sheet, that Fed officials started talking all of a sudden about reducing the size of the balance sheet, which would effectively be a, a, a stronger form of tightening of financial conditions than simply raising interest rates. It was very curious timing, and I don't think that we would have heard the same strong talk out of the Fed had the results of the election been different. Now, do you think that people are waking up to the negative impact the Fed actually does have on the American people and how it benefits Wall Street at the expense of the American people? I think people are waking up to it. I think people are tired of subprime mortgages followed by subprime car loans. I, I, I think that the average American, that's exactly why I wrote the book. I think the average American is angry because they feel like they're in some form of a debtor's prison. And it wasn't supposed to be like this. And they shouldn't have to encourage their mom to go buy junk bonds just to get yield. By the way, the junk bonds that Wall Street happens to be underwriting and making a mint on underwriting these deals one after another after another. But they shouldn't have to force their retired parents into investments that are utterly inappropriate simply because the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates too low for too long and you can't get a decent return on your cash. You should be able to convey to your children the miracle of compound interest, which you can't do if they take their hard-earned little pennies out of their piggy bank and put them into a Bank of America savings account. They're not going to earn anything. And people are waking up to this. They're starting to connect the dots. It's the reason I wrote the book in layman's terms. So for our viewers who are interested in you know, spreading the message about the Federal Reserve and exposing the truth, what is your perspective on good ways they can do that? Well, read, for one thing. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to toot my own horn at all, but start off by reading the book. And as the person who was my producer on the Audible book that I recorded, she had done a, you know, kind of a book on lifestyle before that. She didn't know anything about the economy or about finance. She took the book and gave it to her retired mother. And then she took the book and gave it to her daughter. Financial literacy is sorely lacking in this country, and we really do have to take it upon ourselves to educate ourselves about financial literacy, about the impact of it, low interest rates. If you don't do that, then you're not going to understand who you need to vote for every time an election comes up. But if you do understand it, then you make sure that whoever you're going to elect is going to ensure the independence and the rebuilding and the reformation of the Federal Reserve. Now, I wanted to get back to something you were saying earlier about how we just need to get the right people into the Federal Reserve. I know some people hold the view that the Federal Reserve, by its very nature, the very nature of a fiat or paper monetary system is flawed to begin with, and the solution would be to abolish the Fed and go back to a gold standard. What is your perspective on that? You know, as much as I would love to feed that line of thinking, I, I simply can't. Um, we need an independent and strong central bank. If we didn't have one, then, then the, the Chinese economy would rise up and eat us alive on the global stage. I mean, we are, if there's one thing the financial crisis taught us the hard way, it's that we exist in a, in a, in a very inter, interconnected global financial system, and you've got to have a strong, a strong body that, that safeguards the value of the U.S. dollar. I, just, I don't think it's practical to suggest that we have even the ability to go back on the gold standard. I don't think that the, that, that the level of global coordination exists today 
But that being said, I do think that the Federal Reserve should go back to what it was originally created to do, and that's to make sure that inflation is kept in check, truly measured inflation, not what they define it to be, but what you and I see every single day when we buy this or that or pay the rent or the health insurance bill or, the, or buy that gallon of milk, true inflation. When you say that uh, the Chinese economy would just take over if we went on to a gold standard, is your point there that they would have the advantage of a fiat monetary system and America wouldn't if we went back onto a gold standard? Why exactly do you think that? Well, what I'm trying to say is if, if we were to go back on a gold standard, the, the world would effectively have to go back onto a gold standard. And it would probably crash our economy, and, but by the same token, it would give rise to an alternative reserve currency, which we certainly would not want. It's just not a practical thing to do. There, there's really not enough of, of it out there. And again, I, with all due deference to people who adhere to the gold standard, do I think that we need a lot more discipline, which is what's implied by a gold standard? Do I think that we need a lot more discipline in the way monies are deployed? Absolutely. That, that comes down to politics, politicians. All right. Uh, Danielle DeMartin Booth, thank you so much for your time today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers where they can get your book and any last thoughts you had? Um, sure. You can get it on Audible. You can download it onto your Kindle, onto your no Barnes & Noble. Uh, and I do, write a weekly, uh, I, I do write a weekly newsletter. Go on to demartinobooth.com and sign up for that, that newsletter. I'd love to have you subscribe and follow me on Twitter as well, at DeMartino Booth. All right. Once again, thank you so much for your insights today. Thank you. I appreciate your time.